New day, new inspiration, and today we're gonna answer a question that a lot of you may be asking yourself, is the lake level on Lake Huron ever gonna go back down? We hooked up with Hana from the Lake Huron Coastal Center for Conservation, and we dig into the actual facts. There's a ton of misinformation out there, and she breaks it down, and also gives you a couple key ways that you can protect your shoreline or get involved. Probably one of my favorite episodes to date. Make sure you grab a pen and a notepad, and let's go meet her right now. back to the conversation we we're having when I came in here um, I think the biggest thing when I saw your news article that shocked me was you indicated you know the natural ups and downs of Lake Huron specifically you know impact individual properties but what individual properties do impact Lake Huron on a high level and there's a lot of misinformation out there right so kind of wanted to get your take on 30,000 foot view of what's going on in Lake Huron um, you know, down to the individual level and what people can do to, to mitigate impacts of where the water level is. Yeah. So to start that conversation, I guess, what's happening? Because everybody's saying, oh my gosh, the water's so high, it's never been this high, is it gonna go down? Maybe you can give me a little bit of insight into what you guys do because you specialize in this, right? Yes, so this year was a high lake level. 2019 was um, the highest lake level we've had since 1986. Okay. So 1986 set a record. We are under that record, so we didn't we Break didn't it. set a new high. Yeah. <laughs> um, they did on other Great Lakes, though, so that's why there's a lot of talk about it. Um, the lake levels were so high this year because we had increased precipitation in the spring, like the French River flooded out and actually had a state of emergency up there. Mm -hmm. And all that water that flows along the landscape ends up feeding into our lake through our rivers. Mm. Uh, and then also, when we have ice cover on our lake, usually uh, if we have a high ice cover, that acts as almost like a dome on the water. So it stops the evaporation from happening throughout the winter. Okay. But if we don't have as much ice cover because we have a warmer winter, more water evaporates. So in years that follow a high ice cover, we have higher lake levels because there's less evaporation. Huh. So this past winter we had a high ice cover and because of that more water was kept in the lake and then with the added precipitation coming into the lake that added on into creating a higher lake level that i'm going to cut you off sometimes because i get excited talking about this <laughs> stuff because it takes me back to i mean when i was a kid and they explained precipitation i remember being in elementary school and i mean it is it's a simple concept when you explain it like that um, I remember we shot a series on Lake Huron because I mean the iceberg that flew into Grand Bend and like it was beautiful mm -hmm. but I never thought that something as simple as that, as that could impact the lake level to such a high degree. Mm -hmm. So I mean from your guys perspective what are you looking at in terms of forecasting these things? Are you looking at precipitation, weather patterns because I mean to the general public or layman like me it seems like the weather men aren't even right half the time when they dictate what the weather's going to be, right? Yes. So the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration from the United States has been tracking lake levels on the Great Lakes for over a hundred years now. Okay. <laughs> so they, since I think 18, no, 1916. Wow. So they have a, a long-term data set where they can track where the lake levels are going and through those that history of the data set, they can determine a six month forecast. So their current six month forecast is up until about February right mm -hmm. now, and it's showing a slight decrease going into February. Okay, so it's saying that the lake level should be going down now. If we get a crazy weather pattern and things change, mm -hmm. that could change, I'm yeah. assuming? There's so many different inputs that affect the lake, yeah. depending on the ice cover we get, the precipitation, things that are really hard to predict, yeah. super far in advance. So they can only predict so far and their predictions obviously have a, a large rate of accuracy, right? So um, their predictions are that it's going to drop a little bit until February. That being said, we don't know after February with the spring freshet, the yeah. snow melting off the lake and the spring storms, we don't know if that will bring it back up a little bit again. We do know that the lake naturally fluctuates every eight to 10 years okay. of going up and then down and up. 
So it's a very natural fluctuation that we should expect on the lake. Mm -hmm. And actually these fluctuations are really important for some of our shoreline ecosystems like coastal wetlands. Okay. And the reason why uh, our coastal wetlands on Lake Huron's southeastern shores are so rare is because of that lake level fluctuation. Mm -hmm. It also, in high levels, improves the ability of fish to move inland through rivers okay. so it increased fish spawning so that may indicate that we would have higher fish populations in years to come yes so from an ecological perspective having the fluctuation of the lake is very important but not always desirable among those who live along the lake yes. for obvious reasons mm -hmm. so what has been a hot topic this year is that people who live along the lake shore um, if we had an extended period of low water um, between 2000 and 2011. And that was very concerning for a lot of people. There was actually interest groups that were saying that we need to stop the drop <laughs> and wondering if the lake levels would ever come back up again. And we're in the same conversation now on the other side where yeah. people are saying it's gonna be like this forever, right? Yes, yeah. so if somebody is relatively new to the lake shore and hadn't been here pre-2000, mm -hmm. they will have never seen lake levels this high. So it is concerning for a lot of the population. But for those who have been on the lake since the 80s where we yep. did see these high levels, they are a little bit more cognizant of the fact that the lake levels will come back down and it's a natural cycle. Mm -hmm. But it is concerning for people who have buildings that are within hazard zones and they their investments are at jeopardy. So the biggest thing that they want to do, obviously, as we all would, is to protect their investments. But they often don't know how and what the best methods are for that. So let's rip through a couple of those. Um, I know you'll be limited in scope because conservation authorities in certain jurisdictions have their own mandates and you really need to do your due diligence. Um, I can promise you the biggest mistake that we see is people just run in and trust the word of somebody that maybe you know deals with these things on an infrequent basis at best and they don't dig any deeper. Um, I want to put you guys on this platform because you guys have a lot of great information out there. And I mean, you could just walk in in Goderick and talk to them about what they're seeing happening and you know, do your homework because it will impact your investment. Um, but I'm going back to what I was saying. What are a few key things that you would do and what are some things that you might not do um, to protect your investment if you owned a property that was seemed in peril? Yeah. It really depends on where along the shoreline you live. So if you live in the southern basin of Lake Huron between Sarnia and Amberley, um, there's highly erodible shoreline made up of clay and sand yeah. and silt. So we have the large bluffs, the deep gullies, and then as we go into Lambton County, it flattens out a bit and we have the large dune ecosystems. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the lake bottom too, it, it has a very shallow decrease uh, in lake level. Yeah. So you could walk out a lot farther versus if you're on the Bruce Peninsula, there's that hard shoreline of bedrock limestone and a very steep decrease in lake bathymetry or the lake bottom. Okay. So if you live up there uh, and the lake levels go up a meter, it won't be as noticeable if, uh, if, if you live in Lambton County and the lake comes up a meter, it'll go much farther inland. Definitely. So depending on where you live um, and the type of sediment or lakeshore that you live on, the recommendations are slightly different, but there are commonalities. So okay. the common ones are, um, if you live on a beach, making sure that your infrastructure, any cottages or sheds or- Decks. Decks, yeah. areas, tiki huts, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you name see, it, we see, see it all. all. Yeah. Um, anything like that should be far enough back uh, that the lake won't come up in the spring okay. and take it away. Yeah. Another huge thing is making sure that we have our natural infrastructure in place. Uh, our natural ecosystems have provided a ton of services and one of those is buffering the abuse that the shoreline takes from those winter and spring and fall storms. Okay. So easy, simple and very inexpensive ways to do that are to rebuild dunes. So dunes are naturally forming mm -hmm. on the southern half of yeah. the Pinery area, course. that whole, like, I mean, they're spectacular when you see them, right? Yeah, I mean, even King Carden. Yeah. King Carden Maid Beach has done an amazing job at restoring their dune ecosystems, and they're beautiful. Yeah. All it takes is some sand fencing, putting that up at the end of the season. Right now is a right great now. time. Yeah. <laughs> In October, September. Okay. You put that parallel to the shoreline and planting. It builds up. You know, it's funny yeah. you say that. 
because I see everything, right? I go, we go all the way from Sarnia all the way up to King Carden. I'm, I'm going to be in King Carden later, or later today. Um, when I see people that really create kind of just a wall versus somebody that does sand fencing, like look at Grand Bend's main beach. They've done the sand fencing for years now and it comes like their beach is like a hundred feet. Yes. If you actually look from the parking lot to the actual frontage, mm -hmm. right? So it seems like that is the best solution. Mm -hmm. um, and another client of mine, funny you say that, we're talking about that now, and it was all this fencing that he didn't really understand what it was there for. Yeah. And when we looked back, it was historically to keep the sand. He had a problem because he had too much sand, and everybody's complaining they don't have enough. So, yeah. I mean, are there contractors that you bring in to do stuff like that, or there's specific people that you would call to do that, or is it just the, the actual property owner? We have a lot of programs through the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation that work on restoration. Okay. It depends on which area you're in, yeah. but we do dune restoration all the time. Hmm. And it's very successful, like I said, very inexpensive, and it has longevity. So you can do it year after year. Once you have the supplies, so the dune fencing, that's fairly inexpensive too. Um, you put it in in the fall, you take it out in the spring, and then you can still enjoy your beach during the summer. Yeah. But it protects your shoreline during the most abusive time of the year, yeah. which is when we have all the storms and the ice scour that will take parts of the lake away or the shoreline. Because it's the these, th and the ice scour is like big pieces of ice that are coming up to the shoreline and then just raking yeah. it back, right? Yes, yes. So um, sand fencing and planting dune grass. Okay. And you can get dune grass from neighbors who have a large patch of dune grass or from other areas if you ask. Um, like the public, if there's a public beach that has a lot of dune grass, you can ask the municipality. Okay. Or you can work with us and, and decide what kind of plants are good for your property. So having that natural infrastructure in dunes is great. Mm -hmm. If you live in an area that's on a bluff or a forested area, making sure, and even on in mature dune areas, yeah. having vegetation. So that can be trees or it can be shorter ground cover species. Um, Dan from GCL, um, he's been great with my clients because he's watched it go over the last, you know, 20, 30 years that they've been doing what they're doing. That's what he says. Like the first thing is always like, you know what, ground cover, vegetation, proper drainage, yeah. and then let it do its thing, yeah. right? And unfortunately there are certain situations where there are things that have happened because of what neighbors have done and whatnot mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, let's dig into that a little bit. So like individual people can affect the entire coastline, right? Yeah. And what do you think people need to think about when they're doing systems in terms of working as a collective versus just worrying about their little piece of the pie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really challenging issue because a lot of times when you have a property, your values or the reason why that you're going to the lake, buying property on the lake and enjoying mm -hmm. it might be different than your next door neighbor or the next door neighbor For after sure. that. So uh, a lot of the systems that are can be employed to help protect your property and the shoreline work best on like a community scale or on a large larger scale or if you do something that is detrimental to your shoreline that can negatively impact other people yeah. um, along the shoreline so say if you were to put a groin out which is a met, typically a metal perpendicular yeah, structure straight, into yeah. the water yeah. that will help gather sand as it flows through the near shore waters onto your property but it starves the the property on the lee side of that structure oh, okay. and ends up eroding away their beach. Mm -hmm. So although you're increasing your beach area, you're hurting your neighbors. And if everybody beach. above you starts doing the same thing, then technically they're taking your sand and it's just, yeah. it's, you need to have a, an abundance mentality of working together sometimes versus yes. just worrying about this because this, if I just focus on that nonstop for 50 mm -hmm. years, and everybody does the same thing as a collective, mm -hmm. you kind of imbalance them a little bit, right? Yeah, even um, a lo uh, one thing that a lot of people have been asking us about this year with the high lake levels is in installing armor stone. Mm -hmm. So armor stone are those large yep. concrete blocks or gabion baskets, which are the metal baskets that are filled with rocks. Mm -hmm. And they put those parallel to their shoreline to act as a wall. Mm -hmm. However, if you think about when you're driving a car, and the air is going over your car and flowing and there's yeah. that aerodynamic property, right? Well, waves are the same thing. They have energy. Yeah. So on a natural beach, if this is your beach, the waves come up and then they dissipate and they go back. Mm -hmm. They come up and dissipate. But if you put a wall up, then the wave energy doesn't change. It hits that wall, mm -hmm. but the energy has to go somewhere. So it either refracts and goes back 
or more typically, it hits the wall and goes side to side. Okay. So the wall obviously would have an ending, typically at the end of their property lines, yeah. and it would end up eroding out the shoreline on either side of that wall. So you have this one little strip that might be protected, but yeah. on a larger scale, long term, you're going to damage your system even more. Yes. Hmm. So if it the wave energy would hit the wall and refract and cut out the areas on either side, or it would go down and end up eroding out the bottom uh, of underneath like, it yeah, eventually like, and fall in. Right. Exactly. So the Armistone conversation is kind of the same thing. I mean, if you're, if you're protecting a piece of shoreline and you're not doing it as a collective, basically you're going to be eroding both sides and eventually it's going to go underneath. So yeah, yeah that, that's an interesting conversation. And like, I'm thinking about what you said about the dune grass and going back mm -hmm. the, the large fencing places where I see it, the beach is pristine yes. because there is that natural progression. So again, yes. if you're going to do something, most cost effective solution is going to be building up that the natural embankment and then protecting it if you're on a high erosion area with ground cover and, and proper drainage is that part of it as well definitely proper drainage okay well one thing about those hardened shorelines is since the 1990s and early 2000s the u.s army corps of engineers has studied shoreline hardening structures on the great lakes specifically okay um, and they have seen that they are not as effective as they are in oceanic environments. Mm -hmm. And that's because of that high dynamic of lake level change. They're extremely expensive to put in. And one thing that a lot of people forget about is the maintenance. So they estimate a three to 5% of the overall cost of that structure should be put into maintenance every year to do replacements. And they only really have a lifespan about 15 to 20 years. So like an air conditioner, if that gives yeah. you guys a frame of reference, right? And in the HVAC, we tell people the same thing. You're putting aside one percent of the purchase price of your home on a yearly basis for maintenance so bump that up a bit if you're dealing with something like that um you know i'm curious about one thing because you touched on it what's the dynamic between canada and the us in terms of you know sharing information collaborating we have different ecosystems and everything else but i'm mm -hmm. sure mandate wise you guys have similar interests to protect and preserve right yeah there's a lot of partnership between the states and canada to protect our shorelines and there's a lot of really unique ecosystems that exist along both countries so our great lakes are shared mm -hmm. um, and we have amazing dune ecosystems in lake huron and in michigan and we suffer the same kind of problems of, of erosion but the commonality is the solutions mm -hmm. and that is maintaining that natural buffer zone between your infrastructure and the shoreline. So those are not only way cheaper, but they kind of act as that sacrificial lamb. Yeah. So in times of high lake level, it's not the time to install <laughs> these kinds of infrastructure or natural infrastructure okay. because there's very little shoreline to work with. These kind of um, systems. ecosystems and, and natural infrastructure can be put in during low lake levels when you have more beach to work with. But when you install it in a low lake level time and then the lake comes up and it scours and takes it away naturally, that's how it naturally works, um, you're not losing a huge amount of money in that investment yep. and that's what it's meant to do. And you're, you're replacing it every low cycle essentially, but I, I guess the question I would have for you, pretend I'm a property owner on the lakefront, mm -hmm. what do I do now? Because it's in a high lake level and we're seeing erosion people. I know there's certain areas that are very concerned because of the erosion they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, what would you do if you were in a high lake level like we are now? Yeah, so for people who live um, on beaches or yep. on top of bluffs or even in forested ecosystems, maintaining those mature dunes or those mature ecosystems that are meant to be kind of the last resort. Yep. Um, so revegetating. In our area and on our coastline, the Emerald Ash Borer has taken out a lot of trees. It's insane. So we're seeing yeah. a lack of canopy, we're seeing dead trees on uh, shorelines. So working with conservation authorities have great pricing for fall and spring tree planting programs. So okay. you can get trees for really cheap. I had I didn't even know that. Yes. And we do this a lot. Like we're, we'll put you guys in our service provider database and I think it'll be a natural introduction right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Even for people not lakefront, right? Mm -hmm. If they're in those areas like yeah. Huron Woods or you go up to Godridge and, and areas that have forested areas rather than then bringing in stuff that doesn't belong there. Okay. Should probably do native, right? Yeah, they're all native species. Anything that's drought tolerant okay. is great. If you're doing ground cover species, things that will attract pollinators or will be able to withstand some of the um, harsh conditions, that is the most important thing because yeah. it is a harsh environment on our shoreline and it's 
trying for a lot of vegetation. So the vegetation that exists on the shoreline is specially adapted to stay there. Okay, we have a guest, so if you want to take her, you can. I'll okay. cut this and then we'll come right back in a second. Okay. Was it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually, I'm super hyped that we did this um, just from the standpoint of having a resource to connect people with, right? Mm -hmm. for, for the ground cover conversation. There's one client I have in mind right now and she's like, you know, I guess the biggest question that I would have for you is, you know, going off past cycles and I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you know, the lake is as high as it's ever been. Will it go back down eventually? Eventually, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, it's really, um, it's very interesting when you hear the media hyping up the high lake levels because when you compare it to average, you could say, you know, like it's a meter above average and people are like, oh my gosh, a meter above average. But we have to remember that that average is just an average. It's, yeah. We have these huge highs and then these low lows and the average is just in between. Yeah. And the difference between the high and the low could be two meters, but um, from year to year, it doesn't just go from a high to a low right away. It's yep. usually like progressive, a very like slow, gradual increase. And in you years. say like eight to ten year cycles. This cycle started in like 2011, 12 ish. Yeah, I think it. So our last low was 2013. Okay. So from 2000 to 2013, we had an extended low. So we actually missed a high within okay. there. Wow. Um, yeah, and then our last high was in 1997. So we're, you know, let's say six years into the extended low, and then, you know, if it's eight to 10, that's, you know, an ideal time to buy high lake property with no beach, because the beach will come back and then you yeah. can sell it then too. But, yeah. um, you know, I, it's, that was really what I was looking to find out, because I think there's so much misinformation, you know, people, anybody that has access to the internet can write an article about it. and you know, can be a keyboard warrior and tell you things and start a conversation and then it goes to a Facebook group and Facebook's algorithm is all about negativity and then the media gets it. You know, I always, I'm a big proponent of going straight to the source. Um, you know, I think technology is great from the standpoint that it connects you with people like Hannah and you can have access to just have a conversation with them. I sent you a direct message online. It led to us doing this rather than just listening to Uncle Jimmy who happened to be in the area for five years and said, oh, it's gonna be like this forever. Um, you know, I'm conservative by nature. I told you that when I came in, I tell people, let's play devil's advocate and assume that it's gonna be like this forever because then I'm doing my job ethically. But, you know, being a little bit more proactive, it didn't take a lot of effort to get the information from you. So no. um, I really want to connect people with you and give them access to what you guys do. I'm definitely gonna take you guys up on that offer and, and look at the fall and spring planting programs and how I can help my clients with that and even my property. Mm -hmm. What is the easiest way for people to reach you um, online or actually physically come and see you? We have tons of resources. We're a very, very lucky organization. We're a nonprofit charitable organization and we provide resources free online on our website, lakehuron.ca. Okay. It's a we great have, URL to have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're really lucky to have that. Yeah, it's yeah. nice and easy. But uh, we have all, all kinds of different re like print resources. Okay. We have webinars and videos on there for people to listen and read. Um, or watch and all of this is is free to access at any time so you can watch it right before bed or awesome. or when you're at work but it all the information that we put out and on our on our social media pages they really try and keep people up to date with the most current information of what's going on but then also reiterating those points of what else is going on on our lakeshore who else is working on the lake and yeah. what are there what things are other people doing that are amazing and that we can share amongst ourselves partnerships, sharing information, and sharing our successes and failures is really important because yeah. reinventing the wheel is never never fun. But I think that we, we have, get wrapped up in which community we're in and what our neighbors mm -hmm. are doing. But we have to also look at, there's so many other communities on the lake that are experiencing the same thing and what solutions have they come up with? So the information that we like to provide on our website might say King Carden Dunes. But if you live on a dune environment and you're down by Sarnia, it could still apply to you. Yeah. So we have best management practice guides that talk specifically to landowners about what kinds of things they can do on their shoreline to help protect it or help improve it. And these are all free resources for anyone to look up. 
I'm pretty excited. Um, you know, even from my perspective, I'm going to ramp up my education in terms of identifying shorelines so that I can literally say, hey, you know, to this owner, it's this, contact her if you have any questions. And then, you know, it's community building. And I think you touched on a great topic that, you know, we all enjoy the entire coastline. Like I happen to live in Grand Bend, but at the same time, I'm up here all the time. I'm in London, I'm all over the place. And you have people that have interests in various communities and have friends and family in various communities. And we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. um, so they're here for you guys. I'm so happy we took the time to do this. And yeah, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, and one last thing is that our Great Lakes are a shared resource. Mm -hmm. They provide drinking water, Lake Huron provides drinking water for 2.4 million people. Wow. So anything that we do or any things that we add to our lake affects our greater system. So protecting these and ensuring that it's going to be a fresh and healthy resource for future generations is so important. So making sure that you are educated in the risks and the positives and things that you can do fairly easily all help protect that shared resource so we're happy to to help in that education piece that's awesome and the most selfish thing you can do is give back so you know connect with these guys if it's on your heart to donate to them as well too feel free um, and if you go to the beach pick up your trash thank you Hannah. i appreciate it thank you so much take care <laughs>